This is Zoe John from saying hi to my friends in Vietnam. Today I'm going to present a teaching on five foundations for being steadfast. Our theme verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It reads, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. The theme of this series of messages is being steadfast, and today we'll present the introduction. Being steadfast means always trusting in God. Unfortunately, the level of our faith often depends on our circumstances. That results in being up and down and means we waver. This is an issue involving both our hope and our faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance is something you can touch and see, hear or taste. In other words, if something has substance, it's real or true. This verse says that faith is substance and evidence. Our faith itself has a supernatural element to it because the process of coming to faith is not achieved independent of God, but rather involves him. It is our faith that links us to the invisible God. God is real, and through faith, he becomes real or substance to us. You could say that faith brings to reality the things we wish or hope for. Therefore, faith activates our beliefs or what we hold to be true. This applies to everyone because every belief requires an element of faith. Only God knows everything. Therefore, each human being chooses their own beliefs and view of reality based on limited information. However, when that limited information includes supernatural revelation from God, we are talking about evidence on another level that is impossible to fully explain to those who haven't experienced it. So while faith is not achieved apart from God, it is still our responsibility, it's our decision. This is why Hebrews 11:6 tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God. We could also add that without faith, it's impossible to know God. The focus of our faith is on the present. Faith allows God to be a present reality to us. Faith is a decision made with our will, but it's made with our heart and emotions more than our mind or intellect. 1 Thessalonians 5:8 refers to putting on the breastplate of love, a breast uh, of both uh, faith and love. A breastplate protects chiefly the area of your heart. Now we will examine the role of hope. What does hope look like? Derek Prince defines it as a serene, confident expectation of good. The basis of this confidence is the goodness of God himself and the surety of his promises. Hope is eternal because so are God's promises. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says, putting on the helmet of hope of salvation. A helmet protects the head where a mind and intellect reside. Thus, hope is an attitude of the mind. The focus of hope is on the future and involves our outlook on the future. For those who believe that Jesus bore our sins in total on the cross, and that he rose from the dead to demonstrate his victory over sin and death, the outlook on the future is great. Our mind should have a positive outlook that sees any negatives or suffering in this life as minor by comparison. Optimism should be at the core of our minds as we look to the future. We should constantly be looking for what is good in every situation. It is easy to see that this will lead to being more thankful. Optimism creates positive emotional and intellectual energy, whereas pessimism is a drain on our energy. Therefore, hope adds strength to our faith so that it can endure. Hebrews 6.19 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. And that word presence in this verse is capitalized. Our faith 
when strengthened by hope, takes us into the Father's presence, where Jesus is intervening for us and giving us the certainty of forgiveness through his blood. We are firmly anchored by both God's presence and his forgiveness. We need this spiritual vision of our position, even when God seems far away. This is the function of hope. It gives us a steady assurance of God's goodness, even when we are suffering. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, uh, speaks of the steadfastness of hope. Hope, like faith and love, is a gift from God that comes through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And believe it or not, it comes through tribulation. Romans 15.4 reads, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through the perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Romans 5.3-5 reads, Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. During my first year in college, most of my professors and my fellow students did not believe in God. By the end of that year, I also did not believe in God. My second year in college, I had a Christian roommate who was witnessing to me about Jesus. I told him I would have to have proof before I could believe. In order to be saved in the first place, I had to repent of going my own way and meet God on his terms by faith. When I did that, the presence of God entered my life through the Holy Spirit, and I had the proof I was seeking. In other words, I was saying, give me the proof and I'll believe. But God says, believe, and then I'll give you the proof. As a Christian, I've also tried to reverse the order. I've asked God for answers or made requirements that he wasn't willing to meet at the time. I've discovered that when I meet difficulties or things I don't understand, that I have to put things in God's order by trusting first. Many times God responds by giving me the answers to my questions, but some things may never be answered until I'm in heaven. When we have faith to accept that we uh, accept this, then we're being steadfast. Hebrews 6.12 reads, Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Patience is faith that endures. However, having patience in the midst of spiritual battles is easier said than done. We often experience the fog of war and the confusion of not knowing all the answers. The best way to deal with things we don't understand is to focus on things we do understand. As we meditate on these truths, we strengthen our personal foundation of faith. Doing this is how I became a Christian. The man who led me to the Lord got me to take my focus off my doubts and put it on God's promises. He challenged me by asking me a question. He said, if you could know God personally, would you want to? That cut to the heart of the matter. We were created to live in fellowship with God as Adam did in the garden of Eden. Adam's fall caused us to be separated from God. That creates a vacuum that only God can fill. We experience this hole in our hearts as a longing to know God and his purposes for us and for mankind. Despite this longing, I didn't think I had the necessary faith. How much faith do we need to know God? Jesus said that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Jesus described mustard seeds as the smallest of all seeds, but with the potential to grow bigger than any other herb and become the size of a tree. I answered this man's question by saying that if I could know God personally, I definitely wanted to. He showed me how to make a decision which led me into a personal relationship with, his, with God and his son, Jesus Christ. I followed his instructions to pray the sinner's prayer on my knees. 
I don't remember the exact words which I repeated after him, but I knew I was making a commitment to give my life to Christ with the smallest amount of faith. It was just enough faith to repeat the prayer and mean it. Romans 10, 13 promises, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13 promises, for whoever calls on the name of uh, promises uh, that whoever, uh, that's the amount of faith I had, enough to call on his name. After this, I began reading the New Testament. As I read it, I came to a quiet assurance that it was true, that Jesus was who he said he was, and that he had taken my sins on the cross. This type of certain faith that I'm speaking of here has two sources, which are both supernatural. The first source is the word of God, which I had heard on the night that I prayed and which I began reading afterwards. Romans 10, 17 states, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The second source is the Holy Spirit. Acts 10, 45 says that the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out on us. Since that time, uh, I have continued my walk with God by making the same decision of commitment and faith over and over again. Obviously, as a believer for many years, I had the advantage of having experienced God's faithfulness and presence many times. There, there are, however, always new mountains to climb and new challenges to faith. Where did these trials come from? Trials are a normal part of the Christian life. This is not news to most that most of us want to hear. As believers, we know we have a loving Heavenly Father that has our best interests at heart. However, allowing trials in our lives is not a contradiction of this. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. 1 Peter 4.16 reads, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. There are many sources and reasons for these challenges. The first source is God himself. Why would God allow us to suffer? There are a couple of reasons for this. The first is called chastening. Hebrews 12, five and six says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. I'm glad to say I've been chastened by the Lord. My reason is found in the next verse, Hebrews 12, 8. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Therefore, chastening is done by God to those who are his children. Any parent knows that always giving a child their way will spoil them. As our Heavenly Father, God knows the same thing about us. He wants to build our character. Chastening can take many forms, but some type of pain is implied. However, pain and the resulting suffering does not always mean chastening. Hebrews 5.8 speaks says of Jesus, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience through the things he suffered. The scripture makes it clear that Jesus never disobeyed and never sinned. Yet his obedience was perfected through testing and suffering. In this sense, suffering can be beneficial. John 15, one through two says, I am the vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Pruning involves cutting the branches off. To me, this also implies some form of pain, and it's reserved for the fruitful believer. Sometimes heavy pruning is God's preparation for leadership in his body. 
Look at Moses' 40 years in the wilderness tending sheep after fleeing Pharaoh and David's time tending sheep and fleeing from Saul. A large building needs a deep foundation. What's unseen and underground supports the visible calling. For us, the unseen foundation is our secret fellowship with God in prayer and meditation on his word. When we go through difficult times, we naturally seek God more diligently. Therefore, it is a rule that faith will be tested. Proverbs 17.3 says, The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 reads, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's another source of our trials as well, however, besides God. These are trials from Satan. We know from the book of Job that he is limited by God in what he can do to us. Job 1, 9 through 10 says, So Satan answered the Lord and says, Does uh, Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. One of Satan's tactics is persecution, which is carried out by mankind. The original apostle, apostles were absolutely bulletproof as they completed God's purposes for their lives. But most of them entered heaven through martyrdom, Listen to Jesus' words to the church in Smyrna. This is found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which are about you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is going to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. God makes it clear to these believers that it is not in this life alone that we place our hope. Often we are sacrificing this present life for a reward in the age to come. The judgment seat of Christ will bring justice to the earth, which requires rewarding the faithful who were persecuted and punishes those who persecuted them. First, second Thessalonians chapter one, verses four through eight reads, so we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer since it is a righteous thing which God, uh, with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In order to endure an unpleasant but only temporary present, we need to stay focused on the glorious eternal future that lies before us. Another uh, tactic of Satan is sometimes referred to as backlash. Backlash follows a great spiritual victory and can be in the form of persecution or difficult physical circumstances. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 10 through 3 reads, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. A thorn in the flesh was given me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, uh, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might be taken from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, 
for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul identifies this thorn as from Satan, but also as allowed by God for his ultimate benefit. So this suffering was the opposite of chastening because it resulted from Paul's obedience rather than disobedience. It is possible that the list of sufferings Paul enumerates in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 were also a form of backlash. These verses read, Are they ministers? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeys often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. The best way to get the devil to leave you alone is not to cause him any problems. Obviously, Paul was causing the devil serious problems. It is just as obvious that without God's intervention, Paul would have died from some of these events. Yet God have, could have prevented them from happening altogether unless they were beneficial to Paul, just as was his thorn in the flesh. Paul tells us his thorn in the flesh was to create humility. We are told, told Jesus' obedience was perfected by his sufferings. Jesus warned his disciples in John 15, 20, the servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Of course, we don't want to suffer and we should ask God to deliver us from trials. However, it is unrealistic and unbiblical to believe that we will never suffer. Beyond these things, there are trials that are mis uh, mysteries to us. And I would call them divine mysteries. These are things about God in our lives that we just can't understand. My first point here is, should we be surprised that we don't fully understand God? Isaiah 55 verses 8 through 9 read, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Some disappointments in life are beyond our ability to understand. These mysteries may involve our understanding of God himself, or his ways, or our understanding of some portion of his word or our understanding of a prophetic word given by us or to us, or our understanding of events in our lives. As we said earlier, only God knows everything. We operate on limited information. Here are three things to keep in mind regarding these mysteries. Number one, the last chapter of the book has not yet been written. Richard Warmbrand said, what we call bad is often simply unfinished good. Look at the life of Joseph. He received a prophetic dream from God that he would one day be given great authority. Before it was fulfilled, he would spend many years first as a slave and then as a prisoner, realizing that God's time is not our time. Be prepared to wait for as long as it takes and keep praying. In some cases, complete justice is only obtained in eternity. These questions will be answered someday, whether in this life or the next. Number two, move your focus from the negative things you are facing to the positive things you believe. 
If you feel confused or lack understanding, focus on the certainties in God's word that you do understand and that can build your faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not your circumstances. Remember what happened to Peter as he walked towards Jesus on the water, but then looked away at the wind and the waves and began to sink. Comfort yourselves in the Lord as David did at Ziklag when his own men turned against him. Remember all the Lord has done for you in the past. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, then you know that God loves you. Focus on that. Number three, realize there's a purpose because God is faithful. We can say, I will bow to the infinite wisdom that allows what the almighty power could prevent. God is not responsible for evil, but nothing is bigger than his purpose in our lives. And he's preparing us for eternity. Also remember, there's nothing outside of God's power to work all things together for them that love him. This was found in Romans 8, 28. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dark dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I'm also known. Since it is certain that we will have trials in our life, it is vital that we learn to be steadfast in the middle of them. The way to do this is to take our focus off our problems and our fears and turn to God in faith. The goal of this message is to provide some foundations for you to do this. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the life of Richard Wormbrand. This is the inspiration of this message to start with. Richard was in prison for 14 years for his faith in God, and he wrote a book called Tortured for Christ. Richard went to be with the Lord after a long and fruitful life. He and his wife, Sabrina, were intimately familiar with suffering. Below are some quotes from his book, Tortured for Christ. He said, in solitary confinement, we could not pray anymore as before. We were unimaginably hungry. We had been drugged until we became like idiots. We were as weak as skeletons. The Lord's prayer was much too long for us. We could not concentrate enough to say it. My only repair, my only prayer repeated again and again was, Jesus, I love you. And then one glorious day, I got the answer from Jesus. You love me? Now I will show you how I love you. At once I felt a flame in my heart which burned like the streams of light from the sun. The disciples on the way to Emmaus said that their hearts burned when Jesus spoke with them. So it was with me. I knew the love of the one who gave us life on the cross for us all. Such love cannot exclude anyone, however grave their sins. When I look back on the 14 years of prison, it was sometimes a very happy time. Other prisoners and even the guards very often wondered at how happy Christians could be under the most terrible circumstances. We could not be prevented from singing although we were beaten for this. I imagine that the nightingales too would sing, even if they knew after finishing they would be killed for it. Christians in prison danced for joy. How could they be so happy under such tragic conditions? Around me were Job's, some of whom were afflicted more than Job had been. But I knew the end of the story how that Job received twice as much as he'd had before. We were hungry, beaten, and drugged. We had forgotten the theology of the Bible. We had forgotten the truths about the truth. Therefore, we lived in the truth of Jesus himself. It is written, the Son of Man will come at an hour 
when you do not think and on a day you do not know. We could not think anymore. In our darkest hours of torture, the Son of Man came to us, making the prison walls shine like diamonds and filling our cells with light. Somewhere far away were the torturers below us in the sphere of the body, but the Spirit rejoiced in the Lord. We knew not, uh, we would not have given up this joy for kingly palaces. When he was finally released, his teenage son asked him, what was it like, Dad? He said that the mind-altering drugs, the deprivation and starvation, the physical suffering caused him to forget most of the Bible verses he had memorized. Then he said, but four things were always with me in my mind. First, there is a God. Second, Christ is our Savior. Third, there is eternal life. And fourthly, love is the best of ways. I have no idea what it was like to suffer as Richard Wormbrandt did, but I've often been tossed to and fro by trials, by winds of doctrine, by doubts, by spiritual attacks, by physical needs, etc. What I want to give you are five foundational truths to meditate upon and find strength in during the storms of life. These are based on Wormbrandt's experience and I have sought to boil it down to small jewels that can be hidden within the core of your being and never dislodged. The Apostles' Creed includes 12 statements of faith. I have chose five short statements based on Wormbrand's four statements and also referring to Psalm 137 below. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skills. This psalm describes the dire circumstances when the Israelites were carried away as prisoners by the Babylonians. For them, the Lord's presence, his spirit was not residing in their hearts, but in the temple on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. His spirit was not, uh, they were being taken away from the place of his presence, possibly never to return again. All they had left was their memories. For us, our, in our deepest trial, we would say, if I forget you, Father, if I forget Jesus, if I forget the Holy Spirit, let my right hand forget its skill. Why is this comparison made to the, our right or our dominant hand? To understand this, think about the skills of the five fingers of your dominant hand. You write with them, you eat with them, you work with them. If you are a musician, an artist, or a surgeon, they have highly developed skills. These various skills begin to be developed in our brains, our nerves, and muscles from the earliest stages of our lives. They are part of our physical core. The writer is saying in this uh, saying, his memory of God is embedded in his core in the same way. We are going to take this comparison one step further and look at five ways to embrace God when hard times come into our lives. Think of these five truths or foundations of faith as five skilled fingers we can no more forget these truths than the skill of our right hand, even in our most difficult circumstances. These five things or five fingers are as follows. Number one, God is my father. Number two, Jesus died for my sins. Number three, the Holy Spirit lives in me. Number four, the Bible is God's word. And number five, Love is the most important thing. Each of these truths is like the tip of an iceberg. There's more there than first meets the eye. We're going to explore the depths of these truths and begin to train ourselves 
to focus on these foundational truths rather than on our trials and our fears. This will be the spiritual exercise to develop the skill of your right hand. First Timothy chapter four, verses seven and eight reads, exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. Hebrews 5.14 says, But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Besides the picture of exercise in these two passages, visualize the picture of fighting spiritual battle given in the following verse, found in Psalm 144, verse 1. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands to war and my fingers to battle. Here we see the Lord, our rock and our foundation. Further, we see the Lord Jesus uh, trains our hands for war and our fingers for battle. He trains our hands and fingers with principles that will uphold us and give us victory. My picture of a steadfast believer is not one without scars, but rather one who eventually overcomes through endurance. We have previously discussed how hope gives us endurance by strengthening our faith. God's promise give us reason for optim optimism. Let me hasten to add that there are many trials and losses in life for which grief is the right reaction on our part. While we are not without hope, we are also not without pain and the need to express it at times. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verses one and verse four read, to everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the sun, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. We ourselves and those we attempt to minister to who are in the midst of great pain or loss do not need explanations and platitudes as much as they need comfort and love from the Father himself and from those around them. In this way, those who have been wounded by life receive support to go on whether or not the question of why has been answered. We're not just steadfastly holding on to truth, but we're holding on to Jesus, who is the truth. We do this, when we do this, we're abiding or remaining or living in him. This will produce fruitfulness in our lives. We will not only be steadfast and immovable, we will also be abounding in the work of the Lord, as it says in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. John 15 uh, pictures Jesus as the vine and us as the branches. Uh, John 15, five reads, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. The Bible identifies the fruit of the spirit in our lives as we allow the Holy Spirit to fill our spirit and affect our soul. Uh, Galatians 5.22 reads, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Living like this will produce abundant life in us, resulting in the fruit of the believer, which is more believers. As we become salt and light, <clears throat> we will affect those around us and bear fruit. We're not talking about just doing good works in our own power, but about allowing the life of Christ to bear fruit in our lives. Jesus also talks about fruit in the parable of the sower, which is found in Mark chapter four. Behold, a sower went out to sow. 
Uh, this is verses three through eight. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up because it, it had no depth. When the sun was up, it was scorched and it, became, uh, and it had no root and withered away. But some seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up and increased, producing some 30 fold, some 60 and some 100. It is clear that all of these categories of soil where the seed fell uh, represent people who heard the good news about Jesus Christ's death for our sins and his resurrection, which proved his victory over sin and death. This parable illustrates both the results and the alternatives to being steadfast. The wayside group, which had this truth or seed stolen from them by uh, the wayside group had this truth or seed stolen from them by Satan, the great deceiver, before it could enter their hearts. However, the, th uh, the three remaining groups all believed the good news. The stony ground believers had shallow roots. They don't see, seem to comprehend the true magnitude and value of God's gift of salvation. As a result, their repentance and faith are shallow. And when persecution and trials come, the price is too high for them and they turn away. The next group is the thorn infested believers. Their faith takes root, but there are other things that are also rooted in their hearts. These other things are listed in three categories. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. These things are given, as these things are given priority, they eventually take over and the plant becomes unfruitful. This is a longer process and can be very subtle. The life of Christ in this plant is choked by fears, greed, and wrong priorities. The steadfast believers are represented by the good soil that will bear uh, some 30 fold, some 60, some 100. This is the group we want to be in. And in future messages, we will be talking about how to prepare the soil of our hearts with the right priorities and foundations in order to be steadfast and fruitful. As stated in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, being steadfast leads to always abounding in the work of the Lord. We could say that having faith, which is supported by hope, will lead to love, and love accomplishes the work of the Lord. Faith is an action that is carried out in the presence. Hebrews eleven six tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. This makes faith apart from good works the only requirement for our salvation. And that makes our salvation sure because the, its one requirement of faith is also a gift from God. Yet Luke 18, 8 says that nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? God expects our faith to be manifest in our lives in a trust of him that recognizes his power and goodness and does not waver. James 2.26 states, For as the, the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Works are produced by the love of God operating in our lives. Love is the hands and feet of our faith. Love fuels our faith, allowing God to do his work through us to make us fruitful. Love is a motive. Our motives are hidden to God, to all but God, 
Just as faith without works is dead, so works without love are dead. God tests our hearts to reveal our true motives. He already knows, but testing reveals our hearts to us. If we don't love our fellow man whom God created, how can we say we love God? Only God knows who can keep, who can or cannot be loved into the kingdom. Often it's those who you least expect. God is seeking those who will love him like he loves us. And those who have been forgiven the most often love him the most. Hope is an attitude. It looks to the future with confidence in God and God's power and his goodness, and it acts as an anchor. Faith, hope, and love work together to form God's image in our lives. When these three come into alignment, God is released to bring in his kingdom. For as 1 Corinthians 13, 13 reads, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love.